we're really honored today to have our uh, state geographic information officer, Carlos Isaac Cabrera. Um, Isaac has been with the state GIO office, I believe, from just a couple of weeks before the COVID pandemic hit. So he picked a great time to uh, get involved with statewide GIS. Um, and we wanted to take an opportunity to invite Isaac to join us today uh, to talk a little bit about some of the initiatives and activities he's doing um, as GIO at the state level and how that uh, coincides with efforts that are happening uh, across the state at local government levels as well. Um, so Isaac is uh, is uh, going to talk a little bit about that, and then I'll also just give you a heads up that towards the end of his talk, he's going to bring up a Mentimeter survey. So if you have a device with a QR code reader, your cell phone or tablet nearby, or you'll be able to do this on your uh, on your computer as well through a link. Um, be ready to uh, do some participation. Uh, before Isaac was with the state, he was uh, the GIS manager for uh, Contra Costa County, I believe it was. I'm gonna make a mistake here because uh, I don't have my notes. But uh, with that, I'd like uh, to invite Isaac to come on camera and say hello, and we will get his slides up and going. Oh, you came and went. <laughs> So we'll give Isaac just a moment here to get queued up. Um, and again, I'll remind you, uh, our virtual exhibit hall, our game, and our cake contest information are all on the main page for the uh, for the event. Maybe if I stop sharing, it'll let you come in. OK, there's Isaac. <laughs> All right. Welcome, yeah. Isaac. I was going to let you take it away. <laughs> I didn't want everyone to see my dirty background with my my bike trainer or anything in the background. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> so I had to flip the virtual background on. But thank you, every, uh, thank you everyone. And thank you for the, the really excellent introduction, Steve. Uh, uh, I'm really happy to be here. And I really appreciate the time everyone is is putting into an effort to attend and to interact and to and all the effort that it was to put this together virtually. It is quite the effort. So thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. Uh, I'll I'll go ahead and start uh, the presentation. Give me a second. I'd like to give everyone this uh, like a brief history of who I am. I um, I, I kind of going I'm doing this a little different, going backward in time. So I started off uh, I started off. Uh, at uh, the Forest Service, really working at the Sierra National Forest and with the Pacific Southwest Research Station with uh, research scientists there, uh, and specifically focused on um, work with controlled burns and soil chemistry and really bringing GIS and the, the, analysis, G, the analysis GIS could bring to that effort. Uh, I then moved to working in city government after I graduated uh, from Fresno State. And I worked at the city of Clovis there in Fresno County uh, as a GIS technician. And I learned quite a bit about infrastructure, servers, and, and, I, and it was both IT and GIS focused. I was able to work with different and get exposed at, at very, uh, right out of school to, you know, to things like Cutting edge at the time, ArcIMS, uh, ArcIMS, and to uh, you know your Linux Unix environments for uh, you know, for servers and for uh, software. You know, got to in introduced into the different workflows for in city government when it came to planning or engineering and what G where GIS fit into those workflows and how to learn to speak the language and interpret the needs of those uh, those professionals that use GIS daily. I, I then moved to, uh, I kind of moved north, right? So I went from, uh, I started in Madeira as a GIS uh, ma uh, coordinator there, working with uh, the, one of the larger projects there was working with the then sheriff, uh, the sheriff system that did a CAD dispatch and transforming it with a lieutenant to be able to create our own infrastructure, uh, our own street center line infrastructure data for CAD RMS so that they can now dispatch and geocode in their own system. So that was a first for me being introduced into uh, a different type of workflow and business need in you know, law enforcement. In Merced, I built on that experience, um, working to launch another uh, CAD system, working and launching you know, the first real from the ground up uh, address point data, street center line, implementing new uh, methodologies from Esri there, getting things 
uh, and in, in other areas, working with the assessor, you know, implementing parcel fabric, training staff, learning, really learning the in-depth process of uh, assessors, GIS professionals use every day and how they use it to meet the needs of uh, the, the public working with, and then also branching out even further and learning more business um, in elections and how districting works, how redistricting works, really uh, spending a lot of time to understand business need of all the different departments, you know, working through things like drought and the water table and finding out things I never knew about how we could use GIS to assist not, uh, environmental health with, you know, things like arsenic levels, that type of thing. So, and then moving to uh, Contra Costa County, uh, it was my first experience with a very large county, very diverse need of uh, uh, GIS from planning to IT to assessor. And then my first, this is my first experience really acting at a regional level where cities were highly involved in really GIS. They had a mature GIS consortium and getting involved in that level and uh, leading and driving policy in that uh, in that venue, whether it be, you know, coordinating with LA County and leveraging um, leveraging Lariac, where we could buy aerial photography, to um, working with the individual fire districts to try to create one application where we could we could deploy rapidly and be able to evacuate areas and having several successful. Uh, test with that, and then learning, um, and then getting into new new business with public health and homelessness, and creating, and getting very involved with uh, the homeless count every year. So, uh, every at every step of the way, I was trying to learn more and more, and and then it it culminated. I feel for myself at uh, my current position as a state of California GIO, where I'm tasked with having to understand all those processes I built from and then reach out and work further to uh, fill the gaps where needed and to coordinate not only with state agencies, but with all other forms of government and private in California. So um, I think I skipped a, I think I skipped a slide, but because it's out of order, I apologize. Um, but I'll just go into uh, what 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 is what have I been up to, right? What I've been up to during this pandemic, and um, so specifically, what I've been up to since I started was, you know, I really had to quickly come in and figure out how is GIS being used, where does it need to be used, and where can I help bridge those gaps. So, uh, where it's being used at the state right now is it's really being used in all in many different ways for COVID-19 reporting and including the GIS data that's being created on ArcGIS Online and through different agencies within the state, CDPH, Cal OES, uh, Cal FIRE, the data flows into one single source of truth into our state COVID-19 data warehouse, whether it be GIS data or tabular data, it flows into one place and then people use that data to create their you know, dashboards, whether they be Esri, whether they be Tableau, whether the reports and um, things like showing the progression spread of the, uh, the, the virus or showing tiers, as you've all seen, where, uh, if you all see, as you've all seen in the news, all of that data is coming, all that data is not just, it's being, people are using GIS to create the maps, to talk about the maps and to figure out how best to serve the people of California in a way that allows them to um, think about it, not just as if you know, you're looking from one table to another, but to see the spatial nature of it. And I'll get into that a little bit later, but we're seeing things like geo enrichment happening where people are wanting to see things just as the controller mentioned, we're, we're trying to talk about equity where is it happening? Who is it happening to? Who is being disenfranchised? So that leads to innovation in this space. So as we talked about the data warehouse earlier, you can see that we're now able to ask questions about the data in the data warehouse without 
having to have a desktop software for GIS because the data warehouse itself is GIS enabled. So people can ask questions and relate data that wasn't, that didn't have a spatial component before. They can ask within, near, and this is starting to become the common language uh, and that is happening during the pandemic. And, you know, things like uh, the, things like Johns Hopkins really set the path for, and, and set the standard for everyone. Not only do you want to report, tabular the report, they want to know who, what, why, where, when. They want to go be able to go back in time and see a map of what it was before and see it and compare it to today to drive the policy that you see every day on the, in, in the news. So whether it's a you know masking or whether it's <clears throat> what tier you're going to be in, GIS is, uh, is critical to that. So um, I encourage everyone here to go to the, and I'm talking about this right now, but I, I encourage everyone to go to the, um, the covid19.ca.gov website to get an idea of what I'm talking about as, in regards to um, how it's being used and applied. And if you have any questions, uh, either uh, drop a line in the chat or you'll be able to uh, or you'll be able to contact me directly at the end. So if I, uh, another area that we've been working on, that everyone here has been working on, and I thank everyone here, all the GIS professionals working in California and, and other states and abroad on fires, um, and for California specifically, the public safety power shutoffs. Um, so I just realized that <laughs> it says public safety. Uh, so it says public instead of power. I apologize, everyone. So the acronym is specific to uh, which started with, the, for those that don't know the history, uh, it started with PG&E, uh, our, our Pacific Gas and Electric here in California, um, working in conjunction with local uh, government and state government to predict where fire might happen within where their infrastructure is, their power lines, and they predictively shut off power before that fire happens. And it can happen for a bunch of different reasons, humidity, temperature, uh, but and a lot of it is you know, wind events that cause uh, that caused power lines to arc with um, either trees or something that could catch on fire. So what they do ahead of time is they, what's happening now during our fire season is not only are we having fires that we have to uh, you know, keep track of and coordinate with across county lines, across state lines, across city, across cities, we also ha we're having to combat that, but we're also having to coordinate with the ind independently owned utilities which are in our state of the three major utilities. There are six, but the three major are Southern California Edison, San Diego Gas and Electric and Pacific Gas and Electric. And so we're during this whole time, we're combating this whole, the worst fire season we've had in California history, you know, and we're, but we've been working directly, not only with the counties and with uh, the, the independently owned utilities, but we've been working with uh, we, and we've been working to stream that data to one seamless data layer that both all state agencies that respond to fire and that all county agencies and some cities that respond to fire can see and make decisions with. So the situational awareness has been improved because everyone sees the same data. <clears throat> so that's, I'm speaking, I'm already speaking to innovation and, and I, uh, I apologize for skipping ahead. So other other areas we've innovated in that same space during this time are the use of automation technologies to go and grab these uh, these data out there from their from their origin, whether it be a utility or a fire, our, our Cal Fire or the national fire, uh, our national source where they track fires and fire lines and fire perimeters, and then we're archiving that so that we can go, we can do that, uh, we can have that scenario, what I talked about in the previous slide, where we can do the, we can go back in time and recount what happened in a reporting authority, such as the CPUC and Cal OES or the counties, they will have the ability to um, report correctly for things like FEMA compensation or, you know, for, for finding out what caused it, why it caused it, if we did the best we could do how we can do it better the next time. So it's, it's, um, it, it was very, it was an ask of several agencies that we'd be able to do this. And we were able to accomplish it during the actual, uh, during actual fire. So there's something that little, that, that bit of innovation I'm very proud of. 
And I'd like to use that to drive, if people, we can talk about it in more in depth later, but I would like to use that as a, um, as a talking point for anyone that's interested in that type of automation at, at the local level, you know, or other state agencies that aren't aware that we can do that so that we can have that ability to not only share what's happening live, but share what, what happened and not have it in, you know, broken apart in so many different areas. As often GIS data get, as often happens with GIS data. So um, what's in the future for this? I, I believe the future for this is more coordination with local government and a tighter integration of our shared services, whether it be GIS or data flow or data pipelines or, or even best practices, right? For things like evacuation zones and uh, layers and how to share them, when to share them. <clears throat> So I'm going on, I'll go on to the next slide. So another, um, another thing I'm announcing today, but I don't have a ton of information about because we just started is the state of California GIS strategic plan. And I want to let you know that it is a high priority for me. It will be a collaborative process with not just with, uh, I'm not going to just be talking to state agencies. I'll be talking to local government as well, getting their input and what they would like to see. And it will align to the California data uh, data strategy that the, our uh, that our CDO has already put on the web on the website. So if you have some interest in what it what the, our state data strategy is, I would encourage you all to go to this website, uh, which is uh, I will I will have posted in chat after and or I will provide if you email me. And I want everyone to know that I'm working hand in hand with the state CDO to ensure that there's alignment and to ensure that GIS is a critical piece of the state data strategy. So what, what's in the works? What's in the works right now? What are we working on? And I, I kind of mentioned this a bit, but what we're working on now uh, currently statewide is the seamless statewide GIS. Is this some, there are two seamless statewide GIS data layers we're working on, the PSPS areas. I mentioned earlier that we already have the three larger uh, uh, independently owned utilities, but there are three smaller independently owned utilities. And they are also going, we're also working directly with them through the CPUC, the, um, the California uh, Public Utilities Commission to, uh, to get a timeline by which they will also be contributing. So we'll provide updates and when they're available, they will also be added to their uh, to the seamless layer. Another seamless uh, statewide uh, project are the evacuation hour areas I mentioned above, and we're at the point where we have uh, a, an editing app, and we have we're formulating the strategy not only with um, state agencies but Cal OS is leading, and uh, we have counties already there involved and Esri. So we want this to be as successful as we can. And so we're being very inclusive. We're taking everyone's um, experiences on how they've created evacuation layers in the past, how they create them during the event. And if, especially for those that had no evacuation layers or experienced creating them, and I'm, I'm speaking to counties, and then how they created them during a fire or during um, an event. And so those are very, that's very important to me that we capture that wide audience in all projects, not just this, this project that we're working on that are statewide. So we'll, um, invites have been sent out. If you're a county that hasn't been invited, let us know. We're looking to demonstrate um, an editing app for those counties that might not have sophisticated GIS capability yet, but still want to contribute. We're, going, we're providing an application to, for people to be able to digitize their or provide a copy of their evacuation boundaries on during an event so that everyone involved the state and local and county can see the same um, picture for their situational awareness. And I can't stress that enough, how important that is and how much of a priority that is for me as the GIO to ensure that we're all, that, that as Californians we're safe and we know that everyone is looking at the same data at the same time and coordinating with each other. That for me is something that is, um, that I wrestle with when I know that it doesn't occur, that is, is, is it keeps me up at night. I'm sorry, that's, uh, I don't mean to be dramatic, but it does. Uh, during fire season, it was, I was trying to, I've been trying to keep in contact with anyone and anyone in any county that needs help 
and put them in contact with either the state agency or they are but the state agency needs to be in contact with the county that's my job and i'm i'm really happy that i was able to help and if uh, people still need help um i'm going a little off script here but if people still need help go ahead and contact me they have a lot of an email at the end so the next thing i really want to talk to is uh it's always in the works is we're really starting to rethink how we create and create new standards for how we use web gis right how do you create web websites with web mapping and what we want to do at the state and what i'd like i what i'd like to share with other people is that we really want to make it user-centric design and what i mean by that is a user-centric design means um and this is going this is going up a little bit beyond gis i i apologize everyone but i think that User-centric design is important for the GS professionals here because we create products every day that other people use. And I know that I'm not the only one that's been, I've, that's been uh, accused of creating something that, don't, that works for me, but not other people. I fell victim to that myself when I really love what I create, right? And while user-centric design, what it really, really focuses on is that the users you're creating the data for, the audience, you take, um, you create something for them and you really take that feedback and you iterate on that feedback until it meets their need. And that, that means that that's where success is. And you keep getting feedback from them to make sure in surveys, however you wanna do it. And you, to ensure that it still meets their needs. And that's important. Uh, we, and that's important in adoption and that's important in use because you wanna make sure that when you have something that millions of people are going to use, that they're gonna use it, right? That's it. That for me, that it's a um, a responsible use of tax of ta uh, tax money. So uh, we want to be mobile first in in our applications, and we want them to be. We want them. We want no matter what mobile device you're using. If you have an older iPhone or newer iPhone, as long as it's supported, you know, it, it, we want people to be able to open it and have a good experience, not have to wait forever, have things not load. I know we've all had that happen, and we're. And we just say, well, that's the software. That's how it works sometimes. But what if we could change that? What if we could work with major vendors and we can say, how can we just isolate what we need? And then how can we make it and then isolate what we need out of this, out of the code and make it really fast? So we're working on all those things and we've, we've reached out to these vendors and we've, uh, we're already in talks. So when we get to the point where we have something that works fast and we have a standardized best practice, we're going to share that not only with other state agencies, but with, the, with everyone here. It's like, so, and it, uh, that goes down to resilience, right? Because talking about millions of people hitting an app, you know, how do we make things resilient? How do we get them from crashing? You know, and we work with, so we, not only do we experiment ourselves, but we work with vendors that handle this. So in a good example, I'm pretty sure that, you know, uh, John Hopkins had to work with Esri quite a bit to be able to have, to uh, balance that load, you know, during fires, we work with our vendors, including Esri, quite a bit to balance the load and to question why certain things weren't working. So uh, we're, I'd like to have those conversations with everyone that's a, that's interested here, or at least provide the best practices so that we can we can all benefit from uh, this this new idea on how we want GIS and GIS applications on the web to work. And for some of you, this is not a new idea. Some of you that are web designers first and you know, and GIS professionals as well. But for uh, I think for a lot of GIS professionals, we've been wanting this, but articulating it has been a problem for some of us, including myself. So this was a learning experience for myself. So I, um, I talked a little more than I, maybe I should have about that, but I think it's very important, especially since it looks like the new way we're going to interact with everyone is going to be over the web, is going to be remote. And um, I think we still will be able to print maps and, but I think everyone wants an app. Everyone wants to be able to interact with it. Everyone wants a, a, you know, to zoom in or to zoom out and turn things off and on and they want it fast. And they want it to work on my phone from two years ago. So that that's important to me. And then, uh, so um, that being said, I'm gonna go to the audience choice section and I might be under time, so I, I haven't been keeping track, but I will go to the audience choice section. And here, if you have a phone, either an Android or a phone or, a, uh, or an iPhone, you should be able to open your camera app and, and uh, point it at this QR code and open the URL. 
or you can go to chat where the URL should be in chat and you can click it on your computer and you can vote. And what this vote will be is it'll be a vote for what you wanna, what, what I want an interactive QA session. So we'll get some questions in chat and then I'll, our people, if, if it's allowed, I don't know, they can answer, they can ask a specific question themselves and I can answer as best I can. So I'm just, so I'm just gonna, I'll be admit, uh, I can't answer everything, but I will try. So I've got some questions here already. Yeah. Yeah. So Isaac, I was going to say, if you want to go to the Q and A now, or you want to look at the Mentimeter first, your preference. Uh, Steve, what do you think? We'll answer the questions first because everyone's been waiting for these questions as they came up. Sure. And then we'll we'll go to Menti. And then if you if you could so if you could please everyone keep uh, vote on the Mentimeter, and then uh, and then I'll answer at the same time. That way we can we can steer the rest of the time. After. Sounds good. Okay, so why don't we take uh, the questions that have come up in the Q&A window and we'll just go right from the top. A uh, question from Greg Mattis. Um, do you have any plans to move the county current tier assignments on covid19.ca.gov from Tableau into Esri or make the rest endpoints uh, available so cities can use that data? That's a, that's a fantastic question. And what I can do is I can take that back and I will get, I, I can't, I, I, I can't promise anything, but what I can do is that's a really good discussion topic because um, it is in Tableau, but that doesn't mean that we can't put the data on our open data portal or on the geo portal, right? We can we can push it there. So yeah, I'm gonna um, let me count here. I'm taking notes. You're gonna hear the clickety clap of my keyboard. <laughs> All right. So, but I like that. I really like that, and I think that I like I said I can't promise anything, but I'm gonna I'm gonna ask about that today because we're talking about that today already. Okay, that's great, and. We've got 300 plus people in the room who all heard you say that, Isaac. So we, I, we're going to hold you to it. <laughs> um, I, I, I promised to talk about it. <laughs> right. No, I know. I, I guess. Um, so another question for you uh, from Merhad uh, Kam Kamali, if I hopefully got that close to right. Um, what are some ways academia can collaborate uh, with county and I think also state uh, level GIS fire departments on fire related activities and preparedness? You know, I would really I like work to work with academia. Yeah, we, so we have in the past and we've had, we've had things like, uh, I think that even some of the things that happen with the fires Chico's involved with at uh, Butte County. So that they did, I think they had a lot of the students doing a lot of the work out there for GIS when um, the fires were active for uh, Paradise and the fires they had this season, which I can't remember all the fire names and I apologize. It's not to diminish anything, but they were working on all of that this year as well. So what I would like to do is I would like to explore that more with you. At the end of this, um, my email is gio at state.ca.gov. Give me an email and I would really like to go down this path with you because I believe that that is an important path we can go down. Every county that I that I worked at, I created an internship program. And I know that most counties here probably do have internship programs that you could leverage. And that could be a starting point or to start the discussion about, you know, what other critical events that happen in California can we be involved in besides fire, right? There's like, I, I, we have other minor things like cooling centers and testing sites and COVID data, I'm not all COVID, I'm getting into very serious things now, but um, those, all those things need help as well, you know, and, and places like um, GIS Core have helped out there, but I see where, I can see where um, that would be of great benefit. So go ahead and, and uh, give me a call, uh, not call, give me an email, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah. And I, if I can interject too, from the LA County perspective, I would say much the same thing from, from my role um, as GIO at the county level. If there's ways um, that we can partner better with academia, I've been trying to do some reaching out as well. But um, I think there's room for both the state and the local government levels to try to be more coordinated in our work with the universities, community colleges. Um, you know, that we're all, you know, especially the state universities where we're all part of the same state family and government family. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that question. Um, next question we have is from Atalia. Um, are you the ones following how many people get infected and report it? I assume <laughs> COVID. <laughs> yes, uh, we are. We are. We're, we're part of the, so I wear a second hat at the state. I'm also the, um, in, so I'm the GIO, but I wear a second hat at um, the Department of um, Technology and I'm the, uh, data, the manager of data and geospatial services. So we do follow it. Yes. 
Okay. And do, I don't know, Isaac, if you wanted to talk a little bit about how you're coordinating that uh, data with the local agencies. So, oh yeah. So that so that data part of my role is that in that day in that way the way to actually I think <laughs> not not to delegate down and I'm not trying to delegate any work or any type of emails going to people here. Okay, the, the county. So you can you can you can call me and yell at me later if you want. But the way that it works is that. The data, the, that data warehouse I talked about earlier, the COVID-19 data, state data warehouse, county public health departments actually have direct access to it. And they have, they not direct access, so they actually contribute to it and they pull the reports from it. So from a strategic point, we're all using the same data to report. I hope that answers the question a little bit, Steve, for you and for um, the, uh, the audience. Yeah, I think that that's helpful. Um, we had a question from Lori Williams about the, the evacuation areas. Um, does that refer only to fire evacuations or are you looking at flood and sea level rise and other sorts of events? I would like it to, Lori, you're right. I'd like it to be everything because you're right. Sea level rises, when I was in Contra Costa County, we were already, we were already preparing for that when we saw it happening or, you know, we prepared for a tsunami last year when I was there. That, that's the type of, I know if you're from, it sounds like you're involved in that already, but yes, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to put that in my notes too. All right. Let's see, we're, we're creating new work for, for our new state GIO. That's good. Keep you on your toes. <laughs> I'm welcome. I welcome it. It's great. Yes. Thank you. Um, so uh, Caroline Chen asks, is there a way for a GIS application to stay functional, albeit static, even after cell towers go down during a PSPS or fire event? or how do your apps work in a disconnected environment would really be the-, the Yeah, there, there's several ways that they can work in a disconnected environment. So if you're talking, if so, are you, so I'm gonna ask this, I'll answer this question two ways, Caroline. Uh, if you're the person that is going to be using uh, it to make decisions, like you're a first responder, or if you're the person publishing, correct? So if you're the publisher, if you're the person collecting and publishing the data, and you're in a situation where you have no access to the internet, yeah, that's a problem. So you should have, in that, in that scenario, we should have built, a, there should be a resilient strategy and process where you have sat internet or something of that nature to have access to keep things updated. If you're a person out in the field, and I thought of a third scenario, so I'll answer this too. So if you're a person out in the field and it goes down, the idea though that, that when you're out in the field is that as um, Steve just mentioned, is that you want to be in a disconnected environment before you leave you want to download your area and have an idea of how you're going to use it and then go out and do your work out in the field to make, and make decisions and then you come back where you re can reconnect and you synchronize with that system so that's that's how it usually works in these um, scenarios if cell towers go down let's say that you have a psps or a fire event and the areas around you burn then yes, that is a problem. That was a problem. That was a logistical problem. And I, I have experienced paradise because I, I helped a little bit. So when they, but other services quickly come to backfill, but you're still monitoring it from a state level uh, vantage point. So things, pay, uh, agencies like Cal OES are monitoring it for you and you can coordinate back up to them who are coordinating already. So even if, so you have to rely on secondary types of communication networks like, uh, like a radio which um, can go far, much further than uh, a cell at some points and based off the network. I'll, I, can get in, I can go in the weeds there, but hopefully I answered your question. If I didn't, uh, send me an email. Okay. I think that's great. Um, and Jordan Cooper is asking, uh, what are the plans to deal, uh, deal with data siloing, uh, which I know we all face in our organizations? I, I think the plans with data siloing is to start seeing GIS as not uh, as a, a shared, um, I hate using the word, like shared services, kind of like our common service is what I'd like to say. And, and because it's common, we start, uh, it's about changing the idea about, uh, and, and the narrative around the data itself and that how siloing can negatively affect progress, right? And when you silo critical data, and then you don't have other people uh, for various reasons, right? People have different reasons for siloing data you you lose the ability to one have critical input from other people whether it's good or bad you lose the ability to see that if it's applicable any longer and for other smes to tell you what needs to be added to make it applicable and then um it being siloed by nature 
you know, it's just, it's an access thing. If you don't have access to data, you can't put it into your, you can't add it to the algorithm for the output other people are trying to have, or trying to get to. So I think that to combat it, we just need to change the narrative around uh, data practices. What's a good data practice? A good data practice is um, creating authoritative data, right? With data stewards that can talk, uh, data stewards and SMEs, uh, subject matter experts, Usually the same thing, sometimes they're not. I can get into that another day deeper, but you, you have this conversation with them and you say, <clears throat> if we don't have uh, an authoritative data mo a piece of data that you're putting out there and you're sharing with everyone from a single dissemination point, then we're gonna use whatever we have. And then we're gonna make decisions based on that. And so let's, let's take for instance, and then you, know, you can go to the extreme or you can go, I'll go to the extreme here, cause that's, I'll do it. So let's say we have an evacuation data and they created the evacuation data in a siloed environment. And we all got a copy of this evacuation data last year, but they've been updating it the whole time because, but because it's siloed and not disseminated um, and not, there's not communication channels there to keep it, uh, uh, the authoritative data vintage fresh, then we are all making, we're all making wrong decisions with the data because it's all different. So that's an extreme case, right? But it can be very extreme. It could cost lives at that point. So that, I think that's, that, that's how we change the narrative. We, we changed it not to telling them that they're doing a bad thing, but telling them what we're missing, what we're, lo what we're losing, right? By not being able to have access to the um, authoritative data that they're siloing. And I, I can help in that conversation. I, I, there's been many times when I've been able to explain to people without you know, I, it's not about telling people they're doing something wrong. People don't know better sometimes because they work in that, they have their work they do and their department and they stick to that, but they don't, they don't know that how other, many other people are dependent on it or how many other agencies are dependent on it. So willing to, I, I, I can go talk about that one in a while. So, <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll have a, a webinar separately down the line on that with, with a lot of the folks. Um, I, here's a question I, that I think is a really uh, important one for a lot of folks early in their career. Um, what advice do you have for young GIS professionals who have recently started their careers and would like to ultimately be involved in government GIS focusing on high impact sustainability work? I, I would say that if you, if you started, if you've just started, and you know the path you want to be on, involve yourself with projects that are along that path. And what I mean by that specifically is if the GIS Corps has something you can do, if you can volunteer with another nonprofit that does the same type of work, or if you can involve yourself with the government agencies that are departments in a county that you would like to do the work for, um, get in those groups, get in those circles, go to their conferences. They're not always GIS, right? Let's, we're talking about high impact sustainability. Let's talk, uh, you know, first thing that comes to my mind is environmental. So if you're, if you're looking at um, maybe you're going, or, or you could be working with an agricultural commissioner, right? High impact and renewable farming, sustainable land use. You could go into zone, you could go into the next. So it depends on what level of abstraction you want to be at. Do you want to be on the ground with people? Do you want to be out in the field? and um, teaching people out there using GIS to, with science there? Or do you wanna be at the policy level where you're working on uh, the current zoning and then the current general plan and then you can affect sustainability in that way? Or do you wanna go off and do something completely different in the social sciences with um, sustainability and equity for um, things like, uh, like we're right now during COVID, you know? So uh, I would say, really create a plan for where you want to be and then involve the people that can make the most impact to your life along that plan. So if you need to talk to the, if you're somewhere in the line, you, if you're, if you need to be, get some engineering experience or you need to get some experience in, in uh, planning, or you need to get some experience in environmental health or environmental sustainability, create relationships with people and organizations where you can learn and become part of that, um, that, that group of people and you can get exposed to it because you might find you don't like it, but you like another piece of it. And that, I, I did that quite a bit when I was younger and then finding out that I really, so giving kind of a personal touch to this is that I found, I started at uh, Clovis, right? City of Clovis, great place, to, great place to work, great people, very smart people. But I met someone there. I met one of my, I met one of my mentors there. He was the former GIO of Fresno County. And when I saw him talk and lead meetings at a regional, regionally, 
I really, it really resonated with me. And then I started thinking, what do I need to be able to do to get that type of experience so that I can talk to people in this way and drive policy with GIS or drive, you know, drive workflow with GIS. And, and I knew that it, for me, I, I used one of my strengths, which was IT. So I used my IT strength and my GIS strength. And I just went down that path, you know, working at county government and, um, working on different projects and learning the business of the county government, involving myself with, you know, the engineers, with planners, with environmental health specialists, with elections, with assessors, and getting exposure. And, and it'll drive your path. And any path you're in, I would say, line it with, um, and then make goals for yourself. Make goals for yourself. I want to be able to understand this by this, by this, uh, this point in my career. And, and then you have a, and then you have a fork. You can stay where you are. You can go to a different path. You can go to, a, you can continue along your path or stay there. So, always be willing to, um, always be willing to. to um, I would say personally, this is not, it's not. This is this isn't a job stability uh, stability type of uh, uh, recommendation. But always be willing to explore and to take that next leap because I did and I, it was worth it for me. It's not worth it for everybody, but I would say always be willing to explore things you don't understand completely and learn while doing. That's. A, I'll leave it there. But for new students, I have a passion for new students in GIS. So that took a little longer probably than everyone wanted to hear. So I knew that you were going to go down that path and I'm with you 100%. Um, we are at the end of our time. So I apologize. We won't be able to take any more Q&A because we are going to have to start shifting to the next session. Uh, but we will capture the additional questions and, and share them with Isaac. And maybe he can uh, give some written answers that we'll be able to post up later on the, on the post-conference information. 